Everyone needs compassion Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of a nation Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of a nation
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy brings unending love, Unending love, amazing grace. We're just going to keep singing. Is that all right? the place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace go deep and like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I owe all of you, I'm in all of you, where you
have a seat. Welcome to River Rock Church. We're so glad you're here. My name is Rick. I happen to be uh, one of the elders here, the lead pastor at River Rock, and we're so grateful you're here. Um, if you're a first-time guest, we want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We hope you feel loved and invited. Also, we hope that you'll be encouraged and challenged by the Word of God and by worship this morning. If you will, if you're going to be here and you're coming to visit our church, we love to get a record of your visit just to follow up with you say, hey, this is, this is who we are in a way to connect with you. If you want to, you can get a card in the back where it says Next Step Stations. Fill that out and drop it in the bucket before you leave today. Also, we have a free gift for you back there as well. There are some on the table. There's more in a little tub right behind the table. So we run out, we'll pull those out. But please, go and get a gift. We say thank you for being here today. We hope you uh, get connected. Also, a couple things. As a church, this morning is a little different. It's uh, Resurrection Sunday, praise God. Uh, but we're doing things a little different. We didn't have our community group this morning, but on a regular basis, we're here at 9 o'clock. So there's three kind of major ways to connect with us as a church. One is prayer. We all need prayer, and we believe nothing eternal uh, happens apart from prayer. So we have an intercessory prayer team that prays throughout the week. We also have a team that prays here on Sunday mornings during the service. So if you have any requests, all these things I mentioned this morning, you can get a number of ways. You can get the old-fashioned way on a piece of paper and drop it in a box or drop it in the tub. Or you can do through the QR code with your phone. You can do through our website or email. So all those things, you can connect with us. Um, also, serving. We are uh, a church on wheels, so to speak. We set up and tear down every week. And so as that, we're still a mobile church. And so we need plenty of help both on Sunday morning throughout the week. In fact, I want to brag on our team. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sherry Gasco and a, a team of her uh, leaders led a uh, Resurrections uh, egg kind of craft idea, and we, we had it with our kids, and it was a great turnout. 
And it was a great time of just investing in our kids and telling them about the resurrection. And uh, we got to share the gospel at the end. So very grateful for that. But those are the kind of things we do in our community and around our community just to serve them and give back. And then just two more things. One is um, if you want to get connected and find out what's happening in the life of our church, we have an email blast that goes out every Saturday. And then Sunday we have a reminder for the streaming. So you can sign up again through that, through the QR code as well as our website. And then the last one is uh, giving. Normally we kind of take up offering. We're doing that a little different this morning on Sunday. Uh, when you leave, there'll be some buckets in the back. If you want to give, that's fr a freedom to give there as well. Go ahead and stand as we continue to worship. I want to read a section of scripture this morning for us um, just to challenge us. This is <clears throat> today we get to celebrate the greatest event in human history which is the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want to read a portion of that. Um, this is found in Matthew 28. It says this, Now after the Sabbath, toward, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, other, and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, see the place where, we lay, where he laid. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going uh, before them, uh, before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we get to celebrate 2,000 years later the resurrection of your son. And God, with that, with that news, God, we have the hope of heaven. We have the hope of forgiveness. We have the hope, God, of eternity, God, at peace with you. And so, Father, I just pray that the good news of Jesus and the resurrection will be proclaimed. And, Father, if there's anyone here that has not put faith in you, God, that today would be that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Happy Easter. All right, Romans 5, 6 through 8 tells us that Christ died for us when we were powerless. It reads, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, we celebrate the gift you gave us through Christ, the rescue mission, and the love you gave us. We worship you and only you this morning. sorrow in dead my sin lost without hope and no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash ash was redeemed only beauty remains my Orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes all. chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes you're 
Paul's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom and then It's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your love and through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living home who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of angels stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross I spoke I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me. Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body
to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Now, we're going to share a little bit of a backstory. I, I don't want to assume everyone here uh, knows the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but um, I, I really felt like today, as preparing months ago, um, leading up to this Sunday, that I really wanted to provide a story in Scripture that demonstrated the, the resurrection of Christ, but also in a very personal, practical way would minister to your heart to get you to see what God is really about, which is to, to rescue mankind, to redeem his chief of his creation, and to, if you will, put heaven and earth back together. And so I hope this will really relate. Um, I, I did sermons on the kind of 30,000 foot of the resurrection and all the evidence we have behind that. And by the way, there's tons of that and, and all the historical things, and that's great. But I just feel like from a practical standpoint, this, this encounter that Jesus is going to have with his disciples, but specifically with Peter, is really important for us to grasp. Now, I want to give a little backstory about Peter. Peter was one of the 12 disciples that Jesus chose. And let's just say, um, typically, you know the old saying, measure twice, cut once. Well, that wasn't a part of uh, Peter's vocabulary, okay? He kind of shot, shot from the hip. Um, he was... Um, kind of, you know, had a kind of foot-shaped mouth, and, and so I totally can relate to this guy, right? He just, he just kind of would say things that were in his mind and his heart without any filter, and so this is who Peter was. Now, Peter was also one of the inner three. There was 12, but then there was Peter, James, and John, and, and Peter, so was kind of the inner circle of Jesus. Not that he was a favorite of Jesus, but Jesus kind of models for us this model that there's 12, but then there's three. There's this inner circle that he really pull, poured into and kind of unveiled things to him, to them that he didn't do with anyone else uh, or any of the other guys. And so he also told Peter that he would be a part of the foundation of the church. He wouldn't be the foundation, but he'd be one of the pillars in a sense that he would be one of the teachers, the shepherds, the pastors of the early church. In fact, he says, upon this rock, I shall build my church. Now, he didn't mean Peter, he meant himself, because he is the rock, and Peter is a, a stone, if you will. He's a part of um, God building early church. Now, what's interesting about that is, Peter also, shortly after that, got rebuked because Peter was trying to talk Jesus out of going to the cross. He said, get behind me, Satan, uh, because what happened was Peter didn't quite understand what Jesus was really doing. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but they had in their, their mind this King David type person that was going to come, kick uh, Rome out, defeat them, and restore their land. But Jesus was coming to tackle a bigger problem, which is sin, right? And the fact that we are, have a broken relationship with Abba, Father, God, our Father. So our Creator, He came to redeem that. Now, Peter was also told, uh, uh, told by Jesus that he would deny him. Just, just the last week of his life, called the Passion Week, where all these things specifically happen according to uh, prophecy. But one of the things he said to Peter was, listen, before the uh, rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, no way, Jesus, I'll die for you, right? Now, what's interesting is when they got approached in the garden by a huge group of soldiers, Peter pulled out his sword and cut off um, one of the soldiers' uh, ears. And Jesus healed that man and said, told Peter, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And so, was, again, this reminder that Jesus did not come to take a revolution in the sense of physical, but he came to buy back mankind to purchase us, right, on the cross. And so he had a, a bigger, deeper meaning. Now, Peter went on to deny Jesus, and it says when he, at the last one, when the rooster crowed, he went away and wept bitterly. There was a brokenness. Now, we're going to be seeing in just a few minutes, Peter's going to encounter Jesus. And this, I think, is around the third time that he had encountered the risen Jesus. But you got to believe and know deep down in his heart that he was thinking about this mistake, thinking that he would, he would go to his deathbed and not deny Jesus. But here he was questioned by a little servant girl and other people, and it says when he, when he denied Jesus that third time, it says the Lord looked, turned and looked at him. Think about that for a moment, that Jesus turned and looked at Peter, and you know 
the feeling that he had in his gut that he said he would die for Jesus. And here he was, he couldn't even speak up for him in this moment, right? Now, I also want to talk about the cross because we can't skip over that. Jesus died on the cross for me and for you. Now, I need you to know the intensity of the cross and what Jesus did for us. Now, Jesus was arrest, arrested. He was, uh, it was in a mock trial. Um, he was, there were things fabricated against him and sentenced to death. And I want you to know the Romans did not invent the crucifixion, but they perfected it. Um, they, they were deadly uh, assassins and killers, and they knew how to torture people. Um, it says that the Bible uh, tells us that Jesus' beard was plucked out. It says that he was beaten. It says that he had a, a crown of thorns crushed onto his head. Um, it says that he took um, a lash uh, 39 times, which is of the cattails. Basically, what they did was take strips of leather of different lengths and would tie in and weave in glass or, or steel or metal or something in there, rock, some type of sharp object. So when they it hit his back, it would grip the back, and when they would pull, it would just pull pieces of flesh. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Passion of Christ, um, I think that's a pretty close depiction of what the, the crucifixion looked like, but I still don't think it actually uh, touched it because I, I don't know if Jesus, from a human standpoint, could have been recognized as a human being. Maybe somebody like a burn victim or something you've seen after that just broken and just torn up from his flesh. And it says that he carried his cross and then eventually he made it to Calvary. And it says that they took nails and pierced his arms, right, and pierced his feet. And the way the, the razor cru crucifixion worked was you didn't die instantly. You died slowly, a painful death. In fact, you died of suffocation. Because they would keep your knees uh, bent so you could kind of push yourself up, take a breath, and lay back down. And that's why they eventually would break the, the legs of the thieves so they could get them down off the cross quicker, so they could die quicker. Um, we see that Jesus was also uh, pierced in his side. And all this fulfilled the prophecies that there would be no, no um, bones broken on Jesus. Um, and to fulfill the, the, the prophecy that Jesus had to die and suffer for me and for you. Now, fast forward, we read the story just a minute ago uh, during our welcome time of the resurrection of Jesus. And so we have Jesus, it's probably about three weeks after the resurrection when this story comes about. And so I want to lay it out for us. I want to share a big idea this morning, and this is it. The risen Christ is the only hope we have to be restored in right relationship to God, which leads us to true life by following Jesus. Okay. It's so important. It's so important. Um, John, John 21, 4 and 6, it says this. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to him, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, Catch the net, I mean, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able, not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now, first point I'll make is this. Results of failures can lead us backwards, okay? Results of failures can lead us backwards. I, I want you to see that Peter had let Jesus down. He had turned his back on Jesus, so to speak. And I want to remind us, anyone here is human, we've all turned our back on God. The Bible says we all have gone astray like sheep. All of us have sinned. All of us has, have rebelled against God. As we were talking about yesterday with the kids, we're, we were telling them, no one has to teach you how to do wrong, right? You already know it. You're, you're, you're bent toward rebellion toward God. We as, as those who have raised young kids, you know you have to kid, teach kids how to do right. You don't have to teach them how to do wrong. They already know. And then we see here, even, even as adults, we're bent toward denying God. We're bent toward rebelling toward God. What's interesting is this. Many times those failures can lead us back 
to comfort zones. It can lead us back to old patterns. Now, Peter was a fisherman, and there's nothing wrong with being a fisherman, right? That was his trade. That's what he did for a living. That's, that's how he made his income. But we see Jesus had spent three and a half years with these guys and taught them how to teach, how to make disciples, how to go out and witness, how to uh, begin to usher in God's kingdom. And immediately, right after that, they're going right back to the things that were comfortable, the things that they knew, right? And so I want to remind us here this morning, when you rebel against God, when you break your promise to God, even as Christians, when we sin, there's this thing called guilt that we feel, right? Now, some of that may be conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that's a good thing, right? God, God convicts our heart, but there's also this thing called guilt. And, and, and guilt is basically this idea that you know that you've made a mistake, right? You, you know that you've broken the trust of God Almighty, and this is what Peter experienced. He, he experienced this guilt, and even now you know he's thinking about it. He's thinking about the fact that here's the risen Savior, here's the, the Messiah, here's the God of the universe, and I could not even stand up to a little servant girl. I denied him, and he's still in this. But what also comes is this thing called shame. Now, shame says this to us. Shame says, you're a mistake, okay? And this is what happens many times when we fail. Many of us in this room, we may struggle with something. And what happens is we feel this guilt. We know we've done wrong. And then we start feeling this shame. And I, I really believe that's from the enemy, that shame to say, you're a mistake. And what it does is it pushes us toward old cycles. It pushes us toward maybe destructive behavior, right? Because we, we don't know how to process this. We don't know how to receive God's grace. But see, you need to understand, Jesus came to rescue you and me. He, he, came, he came to purchase us. He came to buy our, our, our debt. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? Not just physical death, but eternal death. We're all going to die, but to be separated from God forever. And Jesus came, he paid the price for the wrath of God. In fact, the John 3, 16 says, we, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but ever everlasting life. And John 3, 36 says this, whoever has the son has life, but whoever rejects the son, the wrath of God remains over them. So we as unbelievers, okay, had the wrath of God. We accepted that. Now that wrath is removed. The penalty is paid through Jesus. And this is what Jesus came to remind Peter what he's done for him. And I want to remind you here this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, what he's done for you, but also if you're not a follower of Jesus, what he did for you and what you can receive from him today. See, I think if we're all honest, we all deal with this life of guilt and shame many times. And if we're honest, many times we listen to the wrong voices. We don't listen to the right voice. So as we continue, I want to read through 7 and 8. It says this, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment and he was, um, for he was stripped for work and threw himself in the sea. And the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they uh, were not far from the land put about 100 yards off. The thick, second thing I want you to see is this, recognizing the Savior's voice is key in life. It's key in life. See, many times we find ourselves in situations where we're not listening to the right voice. Now, I, I, I think it's really hard in this world to discern the voice of God in a world full of distractions. Listen, we've got more distractions today than ever before, and I think in many ways... That's what the enemy's plan is to do, keep us distracted, keep us thinking about, uh, not thinking about eternity, not thinking about what happens when this world, this life ends. And, and many times we get tricked and we just get distracted after distraction after distraction. See, the voices are maybe voices from your friends, maybe your own voice, maybe voices from your spouse or, or voices from your kids or grandkids or coworkers or the culture or political or even religion. And the big one is spiritual darkness that's around us, the voices that try to speak into us. But we have the word of God. We have the triune God. We have the Holy Spirit speaking to us. 
What voices are you listening to? Have you recognized the Savior's voice? See, many times we're not even aware of what we're listening to. And the Bible says, Jesus says, that you can only serve one master. You either love one and hate the other, or you hate one and love the other. And we cannot serve two gods. The reality is, what voices are you listening to? Jesus came to show us how to live life of following God's voice, not our own. In fact, I read the prayer to my group that was in the rotation of the resurrection eggs, and it's, it's the text where Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a fa favorite place for his. I, I had the great uh, privilege of being there. It's a garden of olive trees, kind of up on a hillside, and that was one of his favorite places to go and pray. And he told his disciples, go and pray and fall not into temptation. And he goes for a little bit farther, and he, he falls down on his face, and he, he says, Father, I wish this cup could pass, this, this cup of suffering, but not my will, your will be done. See, God wants us to express our feelings toward him. He, he wants us to share his heart, but he wants us to also see that many times God's calling us. And, and I would say probably the majority of what I've experienced in my own life following God, you don't always get what you want. In fact, many times it's just being honest with your own emotions and feelings like, I don't want to do this, but God, I know you're calling me to do this. I know that I can't fall into this, but God, I need your help because I don't feel like my, my flesh is strong enough to survive. And so listening to the right voices, I would challenge you in areas of life, are you recognizing Jesus' presence and his voice more clearly? Do you see that God is calling us to something greater? Not just what this world has, but something eternal, something greater, something more grand, something bigger than ourselves as he was calling Peter. So this idea that God came to purchase us, but listen, he came to have a relationship with us. He came to interact with us. I, I know, uh, I think I was hearing a story not, not too long ago from a friend, and they were sharing the story of someone who had kind of disconnected from the family for years. And when the first person finally called, they didn't recognize their voice, Right? Oh, why is that? Because they didn't hear the voice of God. I mean, they didn't hear that person's voice. They had forgotten. And many times we're walking through this world and we've gotten so distant and we're not truly hearing the voice of God anymore. And so we have to begin to recognize the voice of God. Verses 9 through 14, let's continue. It says this. When they got out on land, saw a charcoal fire in, pla in, the, in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net uh, ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, pretty good catch. And although they were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and said, and so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The next thing I want you to see is this, receiving the abundant grace is a gift from God. Receiving abundant grace is a gift from God. Now, we need to see this picture of catching this a huge amount of fish. I, I don't know what they would catch on a regular basis. That's probably maybe, you know, a month's worth of fish. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's how they made their living. So that, that abundant of fish not only provided food for their own family, but they were able to sell it in the market. So it was, it was a large amount of income that they received kind of ahead of time. Okay. And, and so they didn't deserve that. I want to remind us what grace really is. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is getting something you do not deserve. We don't deserve to be loved by God. We don't deserve to be forgiven by God. We don't deserve for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. But listen, it says that Jesus did just that for you and for me. We receive this abundant grace. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. And mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is death, right? So we get both grace and mercy. But I want you to see, it's interesting in this story, 
that Jesus is the one doing the pursuing. Do you see that? Jesus approached them at the shoreline. Jesus is fixing breakfast for them. He's providing the fish for them. Jesus is the one who pursues us. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I want you to understand, again, it goes back to the voice of God. It goes back to that Jesus desires a relationship with me and with you. This isn't one of these things where God forgives us and forgets about us or, or some deity in the sky that God doesn't want to have a relationship. No, he wants to have a personal, intimate relationship. And dem Jesus demonstrated this by his relationships here on earth with his disciples and others. And he's specifically saying, I care so much about the one. Remember in telling the parable of the, of the story of the, the, the one sheep versus the 99? He's willing to go after that one. This is a picture of this. Peter, Peter denied him. He's the one the most boastful, would brag that he would just give everything to him. And now he's pursuing Peter. He's saying, I know you've went prodigal. I know you denied me, but I want you to know that I still have grace for you. And I still have love for you. And I still care for you. This is what Jesus is saying. It's so interesting, again, that he pursues us. He's the one who put on flesh and blood. He's the one who stepped out of heaven. He's the one who gave his life for me and for you. See, as you experience God's grace in life, by allowing God to free you from guilt and from shame of your past, as you listen to his voice, you experience his abundant grace. And listen, this is what will happen. You'll begin to have wins in your life. You'll begin to experience the flourishing that God describes in Scripture that I've come to give you not just life, but life more abundantly. This blessed life, this is what God desires for you. But listen, you have to turn away from your sin and yourself, and you have to give your life to Jesus. And even us as believers in 1 John 1, 9 says, when we, when we sin, when we rebel, those moments where we feel that guilt and shame, we still have to turn to him and say, God, forgive me. Please give me strength to live for you. So it's this abundant grace that we see. Let me ask you something. When have you experienced God's abundant grace and provision? How does this impact your understanding of forgiveness? Understanding that Peter, again, did not deserve God's love. He didn't deserve his grace, but he gave it to him freely. And he's the one who pursued Peter. Let's continue verses 15 through 17. It says this, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, and Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Next thing I want you to see is this. Restoring us in love is what Jesus is about. <laughs> Listen, Jesus has an agape love for me and you. It's called an unconditional love. It's the love described in 1 Corinthians 13. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the kind of love that God has for me and for you. See, Jesus is so gracious and so loving to us. I want you to think about this story. Jesus gives Peter an opportunity to affirm his love for him three times. How many times did he deny him? Three times, right? And so great, God is so personal and he is so gracious to us on that level that Peter not only denied Jesus three times, but Jesus comes back and says, listen, I'm going to give you three more times to affirm that and I'm going to affirm you in that. I want you to think about how personal that is. And that's the personal God who loves you and knows the number of hairs on your head and knows and cares about everything in your life. That is the Jesus that we serve. That's the Jesus I ask you to fall in love with and give your life to. Jesus is about restoring us in love. Jesus, um, does Jesus know? I want you to ask, ask yourself this. 
Does Jesus know the answer to these questions? He does. He's God. Peter says at the end, you know everything. Like, why are you doing this, right? You're torturing me in a way. But guess what? He's not. That's not what he's about. Listen, he knows the answer. So who is he doing it for, him? Or is he doing it for Peter? He's doing it for Peter. He, he, in, your, in a way, he's boosting Peter's confidence in him. Because he says, listen, I love you. And just like you denied me three times, I'm giving you the opportunity to reaffirm me three times and understand that your confidence is not in you. Your confidence is in me because my grace is sufficient. My love is all-encompassing. So understanding that Peter needed to understand this. The reasons I believe many of us, including myself, struggle so much with forgiving others is that either we doubt the confidence that God really loves us with an unconditional love or that we haven't really forgiven ourselves. Do you think about that for a moment? Have you really forgiven yourself? Listen, if you hold unforgiveness towards yourself, you're doing something, you're in a way acting like God. Because if God's forgiven you and you've asked for forgiveness, the Bible says very clearly he will forgive you then you're putting yourself in place of God. And just like if you withhold forgiveness from someone else, when you've been forgiven by God, then you're playing God. And if God will not withhold forgiveness, why will you? And I think many times that's why we're stuck in our stuff. That's saying nicely, by the way, because we're in church, okay? We're stuck in our stuff. Because we are not experiencing the forgiveness and the grace in God that the way that God wants us to. So therefore, we doubt his forgiveness, so we doubt that we're really forgiven, and we can't really forgive ourselves. And, 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 and then therefore, when we haven't forgiven others, um, we can't forgive ourselves, or we haven't forgiven ourselves, we can't forgive others, I should say. So understanding where you struggle to accept God's forgiveness, you can embrace his grace more fully. You need to understand, you need to accept the love and forgiveness and grace of God because God promised it to us and he never breaks his promises. He never double cross us. His grace and his love is endless. And let's continue. It says this, truly I say to you, truly, truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, talking to Peter again, and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after that, saying, saying, he said to him, follow me. The last thing I want you to see is this. Replicating disciples is what God is calling us to do. Now, there's three phrases that, that Jesus says, and that two of them sound similar, which they are. So he uses this idea of tend, tending sheep, but also feeding sheep. And so this idea is to teach and to shepherd. Who are the sheep? The sheep are the people, okay? Um, I think in our modern church, we don't quite understand what that means, um, in, in, in Jesus' day, there was um, this rabbinical order, and so basically what would happen is the rabbi would go and pick disciples, right? And they would select, and that's what he was doing in that time. He, he, did, he, he couldn't become a rabbi until you were 30, and you would go about these teachings, right? You would follow, you have followers, and Jesus went down, and so there was almost like this apprenticeship mindset that they would attach themselves to this rabbi and follow them, okay? And that's why they, you see in scriptures they called Jesus rabbi. And so, teacher. But he went around teaching, and he went around investing. Now, he did some credible things. He did miracles. We know that, right? He, he fed the 5,000s out of a few fish and loaves. He, he, he delivered people that were demon-possessed. Uh, I was uh, going through that scripture just earlier this week uh, about the guy who was stuck in the tombs and was filled with um, a legion of demons, and he freed him, right? And so, we know that Jesus, but his main ministry was really teaching preaching and talking about the kingdom of God, but more importantly, he was investing in individual 
people. He was going around, if you will, shepherding people. What, what, is she, what does sheep need, right? They need food. They need water. Uh, they need to be protected. They, they, they need to uh, walk around and, and go to different areas, right, of, of fields, right? All these things. They also need protection from each other, by the way. There are some sheep that like to bite and kick other sheep, right? So you have to intervene. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I know you're not a, a, a shepherd, you're a fisherman, and, and I've taught you how to be fisher of men, but I want you to understand the real role of a follower of Jesus is to make disciples. Now, we understand that Peter was also a church leader, okay? So he's going to become an elder in, in, in a church, okay, in, um, in Jerusalem, and, and he's an elder. And so that qualification for an elder is a little bit different than just a Jesus follower, okay? There's a certain requirement for that, as well as for deacons. And those are kind of the two main roles of leadership in the church. And we understand that. But Jesus has told all his disciples, we know this all the way in Matthew 28, to go and make disciples. Now, what he doesn't say is go and make converts. He doesn't say just, you know, have them pray a prayer and walk an aisle and they'll be okay. He says go and make disciples. And he uses the shepherd term. And so he says feed, your, feed the sheep and tend the sheep, meaning be a shepherd to people. And what's interesting about that is Jesus modeled for his disciples this model of 12 and 3. Now, he had the crowds and at an upper room. He had 120, okay, at the end of three and a half years. And, and that's a beautiful thing. But he really spent, in fact, if you study in Scripture, about 90% of his time was with these 12. And he poured into them and just loved them. Now, I want you to understand, life is messy. Anybody got a clean life in here? Okay, good. All right. Our life is messy, right? Um, our, we're messy, okay? And if you're married, you understand, you know, there's more messiness, right? And then you have kids, there's more messiness, right? Uh, if you have an extended family, it's more. And so it, it becomes messier and messier, right? I, I say jacked up uh, word, okay? That's, again, being polite here in church. But we're, 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 we're broken. Now, all of a sudden, you start investing in the life of others, and you really start pouring yourself in, you're going to realize how difficult this really is. It's simple, but it's not easy. And you try to start in, infusing your own life in the life, when all your stuff you've got going on, right, all the responsibilities you have, and, and the life that you're trying to live, right, you're trying to live for Jesus, and you're trying to, and then all of a sudden now you turn and begin to pour into others and, and meet with them and, and begin to, talk about the word and learn it and, and coach them, so to speak, shepherd them, however you term you want to use, mentor. And you realize, wow, this is a big calling. But what's interesting about it is he doesn't call just deacons. He doesn't call just elders. He didn't call just church leaders or, if you will, the, whatever you want to describe the, the upper shalon, if you will. Okay. By the way, when he calls elders and deacons, he calls them to serve. He actually tells them to fight for the bottom, not for the top. Okay. But it's for everybody. It's if for anyone who follows Jesus. Your main responsibility from this point on is not only to follow Jesus, but to be Jesus to other people. That's your goal. It is to live out the life that Jesus lived. His message is the same. By the way, he modeled and his method is there too as well. We can't expect God to do what he's calling us to do if we want to bypass how he did things and what he did. You know, it's interesting. I, I know, like, there's plenty of great evangelists throughout history. And let's just say you were a soul winner and you, you, you know, led one or two people a day to Christ. You, you add that for 20 years, that's, that number is going to be, you know, in the tens of thousands of people. Okay? And that's great. But if you pour into two people, maybe three people, let's say, two or three people, and you do that every year, and then every year you get two new people, and then those people turn around and they invest. Do you know in 20 years what that number is? It's close to 8 billion. That's actually the population of the planet. And so Jesus' model works. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's hard. And you have to invest in the life of others. Now, I want you to be here today, and I want you to see that I've through this 
through this text today and through this story with Jesus, with Peter, there are many things that God may be calling you to. He may be calling you to understand that you're a sinner, you recognize that you've rebelled against God, you've turned your back, and you need to receive his grace. You may be here uh, this morning and you, you're following Jesus, but you, you, have, you have, like Peter, you just found yourself in a position where you're not living the way God wants you to live, and you need his grace, and you need his love to be restored. Or maybe here this morning, you, you need to be a part of a church that teaches and preaches God's word and lives, tries to live it out the best they can. And you say, hey, I would love for River Rock to be that place. Or maybe here this morning and you're saying, hey, um, you know, this thing made disciples. Man, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've been following Jesus, but I don't know if I've ever done that. What does that look like? What does it mean to be a disciple maker that he's calling us to do? The great news is God has the answer for all that. And as a church, we're trying to model that in our lives. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond first to the grace of God and forgiveness and two, to actually begin to live out the call that God has for you by the risen Savior. Would you stand this morning? Our team's going to come up, get in place for a closing song. And when we do that, I don't want to be remiss that um, today is a, a special day for Christians, but also a day where lots of family and friends and many people invite each other, and we're so glad you're here, and we, we again, we hope you feel loved and, and welcomed here today, but more importantly, I want to challenge you. There's no greater place that you could turn from your sin and yourself and give your life to Jesus than right here, because this is a place that we know without Jesus, without the risen Savior, we have no hope. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you haven't done that, would you do that? I'm going to close in a prayer, but I'm going to also, not, not the prayer that saves you, it's the grace of God, it's you receiving the grace, we're saved by grace through faith, it's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. And many of us try to earn the grace of God, we can't, sin can never be removed by good deeds, it says all our good works are like filthy rags in his sight. So understand you can't earn your way, you can't clean yourself up, only God can do that. But if you're here and you want to receive that, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. You pray that prayer, and if you mean it with your heart, and you truly trust in him, the Bible says you'll be born again. And the Bible says all of heaven will rejoice and throw a party for you today. Okay? Would you do that? Would you receive that grace? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your grace. God, your grace is unbelievable. God, I stand here as a man who does not deserve your grace does not deserve your love, does not deserve wife and kids and the home and the blessed life you've given. God, I'm so grateful. But God, most of all, I'm grateful for salvation. I'm grateful that no matter what happens in this life, God, I have the hope to be with you for eternity. And God, I have the hope of peace with you to, be full, to fully know as I'm fully known. God, I'll be at perfect peace. No more sin, no more death, no more dying, no more sickness, no more war. God, we will live in eternity in the presence of you. If you're here this morning and you want to receive God's grace, would you do me a favor? Just say something like this. Father, I desperately need forgiveness. I know, just as Peter, I've turned my back on you. I deal with shame and guilt. And not only do I need to be free from that, I need to be free from the bondage of sin. Would you forgive me today? Would you give me your grace? I trust that your son Jesus and what he did for me on the cross paid the penalty for my sin. And God, I want to be born again. Would you help me to live for you? Help me to find a church to go to, to be a part of, to read, my, read the word, to begin to hear your voice, begin to live out this life you've called me to be, not only be discipled, but to eventually disciple others. So Father, we love you. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, and God, you, guys, if you, if you meant it, would you just do me a favor today? Would you just come and find me? Just come and find me and just share with me today. Or, or maybe go on our website and shoot an email. 
and let us know that we would love to follow up with you and encourage you in that journey. Or maybe even this morning, if you would have the courage to come and meet me here at the front during our invitation song, that would be awesome. We would celebrate with you. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time this morning. God, do what only you can do, and that's eternally change hearts and minds forever. In Jesus' name. Listen, we hope you have a lovely Resurrection Sunday. Um, if you want a beautiful background for photos, uh, Trista and her hospitality team set that up over there so you can go take a beautiful picture there. But we just wish you a, a great day, and we, we're thankful for you here, and just God bless. Have a great day. God bless.